Raymond Hempstead, Founder and Managing Director of Supervest. Today, we're very privileged to have Brad Fuller, the Managing Director and CEO of Bright Living Australia. He's and his company are a national SDA provider right across Australia. So, welcome Brad. Thanks Raymond, it's a pleasure to be here. Right, Brad, we'll jump into NDIS processes. For yourself, how many years have you been involved in the SDA NDIS space? Well, our family's been in it for like 18 years, in the, squarely in the disability sector. Um, my resume has been a long term in, in property, but also for the last four years we've been immersed in the SDA space. And so, uh, you know, we've had our boxing gloves on fighting for the rights of vulnerable people now for uh, literally four years now, and, and we're embedded in the space and continuing forward. Well, I can't even see an end to it at the moment. but. Um, you know, but that space has been, you know, if anybody's got any doubt about where their money might be going to help us put the roof over the heads of people uh, who are vulnerable, then let me tell you, your money is going to a very good, a very good place because the smiles on people's faces when they enter these new homes is something that everybody should see. So just back up a bit, SDA, what does that stand for? Well, SDA is Specialist Disability Accommodation. It is, it was formed, um, well, some people think it's only been formed recently, but SDA has been around for literally three decades. And so 30 years. Yeah, and I think just a little bit longer than that, but it was in a different form. SDA was a government um, uh, system, and it was in the form of six to 10 bedroom homes. And these were called, well now we call them you know, group homes. Mm -hmm. But SDA has been around for a long time, but it's been reviewed every five years. So. Five years, every year since the inception of SDA, there's been a review. And when, when I know that when people who are building houses hear about the five-year review, they go, oh, Brad, you know, does that mean the money can be taken away? What, what's this five-year review? However, it was never for that purpose. The five-year review was to see if the system needed more money. And in 2013, around that time at that five-year review, they decided the system was very broken and needed a lot more money, which led to the birth of the NDIS. So suddenly, now we've got SDA in a form that we all know today, which is, has a different funding solution to the way it was previously. Mm. And if anybody has any doubt about the five-year review wanting to put more money in the system, they only have to look to the most recent five-year review, review in March, which um, of course instigated a significant increase in funding. And just like in the original formation of the NDIS, they recognise there are increased construction costs, increased loan costs, there are not enough houses getting on the ground to house people with disability. And of course everyone needs to realise this was born out of a human rights issue. You know, everybody has the right to housing. Mm. And that was the basic premise of the NDIS and of course it's funded for the next 20 years, nothing can change that. Alright, so in NDIS just an expansion, what is NDIS? Oh, well, the NDIS is the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and you may have heard also NDIA, that's the National Disability Insurance Agency. Mm. Now, what's like, the difference between the two of those? Right, so my best analogy would be just like uh, the Australian federal law, it's the paper. It's administered by lawyers, barristers, <laughs> QCs. The NDIS is the scheme, it's the paper. The NDIA, the National Disability Insurance Agency, administers the scheme. So, right. for instance, the most basic thing, when we invoice, we invoice to the NDIA for SDA funding, as does everybody. They don't invoice the S NDIS, it's, it's simply the paper, it's the scheme. So the Safeguards Commission, that's all controlled by the NDIA. Everything that happens, our NDIA portal, <laughs> We communicate with the NDIA, we don't communicate with the NDIS. Excellent. So we, for 30 years there's been the SDA. The transition from that into what we now see is the NDIA, NDIS, SDA housing. What, what's the, the difference between those two? Okay, the, the most basic difference was when the NDIS was formed, it came with a minimum standard of compliance for housing. Previously, you know, it didn't happen. And 
of course, there was have been so many people now that can take advantage of SDA funding. And also, we all need to realise that there are two aspects to funding. There is the care. So everyone should be aware of a SIL provider, supported independent living provider. Let's call them the carers. And actually, some of the acronyms <laughs> we should probably cover, <laughs> OOA, right. on-site, overnight accommodation, and SIL providers, the carers, supported independent living. SDA, <laughs> specialist disability accommodation. HPS, high oh, physical support. Mm -hmm. FA, fully accessible, the second category, IL, improved livability. We need to know these terms and of course they have different categories of disability. So wrapped up in that, the NDIS wanted people to have a safe and stable environment. If you saw some of the institutions that we still see where, where people are living, you know, you would know that getting people out of those environments and into housing that is compliant it's, it's a life-changing uh, moment for them. And of course, the minimum standard of compliance, we actually don't believe in it. We believe it, it's only that. There's a new term out there called fit for purpose. Mm. Now, a lot of houses are being built that are just make the compliance. Will they still get funded? Absolutely. Are they, in our mind, fit for purpose? Well, you know, we'd like to see them bigger, better, with a few more, um, functionality items and layout. But that fit for purpose, it comes back, I suppose, from perspective of who's saying it's fit for purpose. There's the minimum standard, and then there's people like yourself and providers like yourself that have got a board behind you that have got disabled people on the board, and you're getting feedback from the participants in the houses of what is fit for purpose. Well, let me tell you, there is only one judge, jury, and executioner and that is the resident of our houses. Mm. The people who have a disability, they choose their house. And we need to seriously make sure that our house is desirable to a person of disability because they do not have to look in their bank account to choose that house. They will choose it if it's fit for purpose. Mm. And, and that is a great question because that brings into play location, design, Everything that makes that house more desirable to a participant, if you are helping us build houses for that purpose, then you should take our guidelines. And look, we did two smart things when we first started. And one was we decided that the data that the NDIS provides, and that you can, everyone can go to the website and find the NDIS demand data, but in our view, it's very flawed. Firstly, because it's three months in arrears. <laughs> you know, secondly, because if we just got the data, which we did recently, if there could be a hundred participants funded today, mm. we won't pick that data up for another three months. And because it's three months in arrears, it could be six months, depending on the timing. So we decided that we need to map that data. We needed to work out where participants needed their housing. So that's what we did. So we, we started to drill down and to look at how many houses are coming through building approvals. We started to look at the existing houses. We started to look at the, the data that comes from people working in the environment, the people on the ground, telling us that they need houses in this particular area. Mm -hmm. And look, <laughs> I'm a bit of a hard data guy, but I'd love the data to be weekly, monthly would be good, but it's not. It's quarterly and in arrears. So we decided we would attempt to get as much of a focus on the data because we wanted to, if an investor came and said, where should I build? We wanted to at least have a guide to say, well, you need to be here because that's where a participant needs to live mm -hmm. or wants to live. We also then started to talk about design because I, I'm going to be like a broken record talking about location and design because one, you need a location which is close to hospitals, big shopping centers, maybe accessible parks and gardens, lifestyle items. The way we choose a house and compared to the way someone with a disability, we, we all want the same things, except they want some, they need some specialist items in the area that they live. So infrastructure is important. But we decided we weren't the ones who were <laughs> great advisors. So we actually have a, a, an advisory board made up of people with disability. and. We started listening to them, and I can tell you, 
when you start listening to the people who live with their disability every minute of every day, then you get the true answer. And who else, you know, with due respect to architects, designers, even us, you know, there's nothing like actually hearing what a participant truly needs. And a good friend of mine always talks about true choice, true control. Mm. Because that's the mandate of the NDIS, choice and control for people with disability. So, of course, they will choose their house based on their needs. So if you think you can just go and build a house that is the minimum standard of compliance in an area that's miles out in a greenfield estate um, and expect that people will want to live there, well, you've had some poor advice. <laughs> yeah. Because unless you've spoken to someone who actually has a disability or spoken at least to an SDA provider, that has a, a, a absolute handle on where the need is, then this theory of build it and they will come will fail you. And, and we didn't want to do that. Our, we are participant led, participant first. And I've said this to every investor. If you get it right at the start, if you get the location and the design right, 95% of your risk is gone right there. Mm -hmm. And you know everyone talks about guarantees. There are no guarantees for participants. However, if you look at our resume, you really need to understand the SDA provider's resume because here's something really important. Participants choose their provider. Investors also choose their provider. But more importantly, if that house does not suit the needs of a participant, and this is a really critical item for everybody, they will not choose it. I had someone come the other day who thought that the NDIA had a waiting list of people and, and they would just put them into their house. There are so many myths out there. And what I can tell you is, as an SDA provider, we certainly only, only want to do one thing. We want to get the best home and living experience for participants that we can. And to do that, you have to provide a home that a participant will want to live in. So yes, our advisory board started advising us on design and layout. And that has been an absolute success story for participants because I'll, I can give you an example, if you like. Yeah. So when we first started, there were many houses already being built because when the NDIS started, a lot of people saw the calculator and, you know, oh, a HPS participant can be funded at, I think in, in around Queensland it was $47,000. This was a few years ago. <laughs> so, oh, well, let's preface this with, uh, from the 1st of July this year, there's been a change in funding based on the five-year review in March. So pre-1st of July, uh, let me call that the old days, I suppose, and from there there's been new funding. And, uh, and just as a side note, people thought suddenly that funding would start. Well, it wasn't being rolled out till October anyway, and we're still seeing a slow, a slow uptake of the new funding uh, amounts. But previously, Unfortunately, a lot of people were told, I'll build a three bedroom house and you'll get you know, $150,000 a year. Um, Being having three HPS participants in the house. Of course, based on having the maximum funding. And it, it was a very powerful story, but in reality, that was a story because mm -hmm. we've never ever seen three high physical support persons in a three bedroom single living area house. And I want to make that point about the single living area. Um, because once you have high physical support people in a home, there's a lot of equipment that goes with that. Mm. It gets very crowded in that single living room. But more importantly, our board said to us, uh, Brad, what happens when we now you know, invite friends and family over? Where's the lounge couch going to go? How, how do we have a private conversation? Yeah. And they coined this phrase, separation of conversation. Now, it was a penny drop moment for me because it really resonated because they said, there's a dignity issue here. Why should we have to go back to our bedroom to have a private conversation with our friends and family? I mean, would you do it? You know, your friends come over, you have guns into the bedroom and we'll have a private bedroom, conversation. Yeah. So, of course we wouldn't do it. Why would we expect anyone else? But that's a problem of design. So our board was like, well, why don't we have a second living area? A place where we can, you know, declutter that main room, have some of the equipment because there's a lot of equipment that goes mm -hmm. with someone with complex needs. So this second living area gave you this space, a dignity space, where you can go and have a conversation. And in fact, 
uh, some of the houses I'm sure have got uh, sofa beds in them where people, friends could stay overnight then in that second living mm -hmm. area and that's a quality of life as well. And sometimes it's not even a separation of space for conversation, sometimes it's just watching two different TV shows. Oh, oh God, I've heard that <laughs> so many times. You know what? What if we just want to watch a second TV program? I, I can remember when our children were young, sometimes I, I just wanted to be in the media room to get away from the cartoons and watch something different without going back to the bedroom TV. Mm. So there's lots of real life arguments about the second living space. And, and here's a good one. If if you are a person who's got complex needs with a lot of equipment, you come to that house, you already know there are two high physical support persons in that house. You've got to make a choice. Do you want to be the third person in that house and bring all your equipment in with that equipment? They're busy houses, mm -hmm. the high mm -hmm. physical support houses. There's, you know, you need to be, uh, you know, hoisted, lifted, helped into the shower, the bathrooms. It's a busy home. And we're finding that people don't want to choose to be that third person. It's not because the house is not built for three high physical support, 100% it is. But here's the important bit. Does a participant choose for a quality of life issue to be part of that? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, it, maybe it's possible, we just haven't seen it. Yeah. However, with a second living area, you know, there's, it opens up the door that you may have a quality of life possible that you would you would see that and look many of those original houses had already begun when we first started so we know the flaws of them because we have them <laughs> in our portfolio but once we got our advisory board on board um, we started saying hey we only we want to do two living areas we want a better quality of life a better home and living experience and let me tell you the people have spoken because give me any reason you would choose a house with one living area over one with two. Yeah, and this, this also comes back to investors looking to get professional advice from SDA providers. There's a lot of people out there, whether they're accountants or um, real estate agents that are looking to see SDA as a, I suppose, an additional rent roll, not having the experience of actually running and managing this type of asset, but also understanding and being able to provide the right sort of housing for the participants that are going to be in the house. Well, that is our primary mandate, to make sure that the home and living experience of, of the resident in that house is, mm -hmm. is as good as it can be. We, I've said many times, and my analogy is, we, we are like, we put a shield up over that house and we watch everything that's going on. And look, we, we do the property management, we're a real estate hat as well. And the reason we did that was, was not for, we don't even charge to do that. But what it means is it gives us greater access to the house. We have better eyes on the house. Mm. And I've said to many uh, thousands of people who've listened to us on webinars or on the speaking tours, you need to look at this through the eyes of the participant. Be very clear on that. Location, <laughs> where, do we, where do they want to live? Design, let's make the best house we can for them make it as desirable as possible, so they will choose that. When they walk into your house, you want them to say, wow, somebody has really taken the time to cater to our needs. This is the house that I want. That's what we want to do. But of course, there's that third element, which is, I suppose, and concerns us, is the right SDA provider. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got a history of disability experience, advocacy, you know, you're trying to enact some social change like we are, let me tell you that it, um, I've said this in many webinars, Raymond, if, if, if your business, if someone sat down in a coffee shop and said they're in your business, I'll bet in 15 minutes, with the right questions or the terminologies, the phraseologies, you would know in about 15 minutes whether they were in, ever been in your business or not. 100%. So let me tell you, when participants sit with someone who claims to have a resume in disability, they get unveiled very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can't be unveiled. Yeah. Because we actually have that experience in this in this field and a, a very strong history in advocating for the rights of vulnerable people. But I can tell you what else, a lot of people with complex needs can't make their own decisions or they uh, have appointed someone else, an OT, a guardian, a parent, a uh, support coordinator, planner, all the professionals that are involved. Now, 
they really unveil people who don't speak the language of disability. And this is why, for the next 20 years, if you had a, a, a child with a disability, and, and sometimes I'm talking about children that might be 30, 40 years old, mm. perhaps with some cognitive impairment that may be functioning at a 10-year-old level, which SDA provider would you choose? You, you suddenly have SDA funding for your son or daughter. Are you going to choose the real estate provider or the builder or the accountant that's jumped into this space? Or are you going to choose someone like us with a proven track history and disability experience? And as long as you understand that, naturally, for the next 20 years, you want to choose someone that if there, if there has to be an intervention, if something's going wrong, you absolutely want to be able to make that call and know that this person understands your needs. And look, that is one reason why we have been very successful over this period of time. Um, you know, we have, you know, houses, I have houses from, you know, Cairns down to, across to Perth. And that's because if I think about it carefully, I know participants are choosing us for those reasons. Mm -hmm. Investors are choosing us because they can see we are connected to the participant world very strongly. And of course, that helps them get comfortable with this tenancy issue, um, you know, and which everyone is, is, you know, chasing this guarantee. Yeah. There are no guarantees for participants, by the way, which is why you really need to lean on the experience of the SDA provider, because participants choose their provider. And that is location, design, the right SDA, I am like a broken record, right? You are, you are. <laughs> but it, it's good, it's location, location, but also experience, because there's a lot of investors out there that have been, also in the past, they've been duped by some of the claims of the builders and marketers about income and being have, having three HPS participants in a house because it's great income. But from what I see, SDA providers, that's not even on the top of their list on the income for the investors. It's the whole focus of the participants because if you look after the participants, like people talk about how long is the SDA and NDIS funding going to be around? Is there a guarantees? Are there guarantees? How am I going to guarantee that I'm getting three participants? Like there's, there's all that rhetoric going well, around the market at the moment. There's a lot of noise around the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. it's, quite a, it's quite a long one. But if we take it one at a time, our mandate as the SDA provider is absolutely first and foremost for the participant to provide the best home and living experience. Now, we all understand that you cannot do this investment for love. There mm. needs to be a balance, and we believe we've got that, that, that understanding. You know, so, but I'll tell you what, if you want less risk on your investment, make sure you follow our guidelines, Location Design Right SDA, yeah. because that's how you diminish your risk. If you get those three elements in play, 95% of your risk is gone. Because I see, I see the, there's investors that buy a normal, a normal house for normal rental, and their questions about rental and tenancy don't come up greatly because it's out in the open market. But as soon as they step across into the NDIS space, there's all this hype about having security of tenancy and having making sure the tenants are going to be there. Sure. And as you know, in a normal property world, it, we can just keep dropping the rent till we get a tenant. Mm. But the SDA is a complex space, and which is why we like to talk about our resume, our experience, because again, there are no guarantees. And if someone tells you they've got guarantees, they're simply lying to you. All that whole, got a whole lot of money built into the deal to self-fund that guarantee for a period of time. Oh, aren't all guarantees that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, even in normal world, you know, if there's a build, if there's a guarantee. It's just the two years. Someone's rent. paying for it. That's right. So we don't play those sneaky or dodgy games we play, we're very straight. We are, mm. And I keep saying to everybody, if you just forget about the money, in, in one way, because <laughs> no one can. That's hard. But, <laughs> but if you forget about the money and focus on getting the right home in the right area for a participant, you, you've done. The mm. byproduct of that is the money. Mm. And in, I've never been in, or seen a business that's so true to that old cliche of, you know, you get it right at the front end and the money just flows. Mm. You know, everybody can win. If we do the right thing for a participant, that will bring the best, the best return for someone who helps us build the house. I mean, we only get a small percentage of what someone who helps us with the house gets. So we've obviously, if we take all the love and emotion out of it, 
there's still a commercial entity behind it where we need to make the investor successful, otherwise we can't help anyone because we won't be earning money either. Mm. But to make the investor successful, we need to make the home more desirable than the, any other home. And that's been our ethos since the beginning and it's proven to be correct. Yeah. Get it right at the front end and, don't, and then you don't have to worry about it. Make sure you make the right choices with the house and location and the SDA provider and make sure you do as much as you can for the house. I mean, I recently had a, a, a talk with an investor who could actually borrow 1.2 million, but he said, oh no, Brad, I, I just want to find a place for 800,000. Well, those days are nearly gone. Like, I would think to get any sort of half decent location now where there is demand is probably in the, it's got a nine in front of it, mm, at least. But there's no point in, I said to him, what are you gonna do with the other two or 300,000 in your borrowing capacity? And he said, well, I just don't want to spend that. But my point to him was, spend it. Get a better block of land. Get in closer to the city infrastructure. If you're not, if you're in one of the greenfield estates where in 10 years' time there'll be a lot of houses, make your house bigger and better. Make mm -hmm. it more desirable. Because guess what? Potentially, that extra 200 is a year's rent. Yeah. Like, and and um, to answer that question about the, the normal property, I, I did have a conversation with someone a couple of months ago, and I said, well, very focused on a normal on a normal investment property. I said, well, let's compare the two. Um, let's pay for a normal investment property. Yes, it's a couple of hundred thousand less because there's a lot of extra stuff in an NDIS house. Or, and then let's run an NDIS home that's 200,000 more than this one. So let's go year by year. 20 years, and I'll deal with that in a minute. So year 19, earning what, 40 or 50 thousand dollars? Even in Sydney, that's all it is. Mm. Year 19, well, we've just 200 thousand in rent, perhaps. We've just paid off that extra 200. Now, for the next 19 years, this house goes forward at 50 thousand. This house goes forward at somewhere potentially maximum of 200. But there's probably a manageable expectation of over 100 thousand now. Coming for the next year. 20 years, mm. coming in every year. So this, this fallacy, I believe, of not spending your borrowing cap, because that will give us a better house to house participants. They will choose that house <laughs> before they choose the other ones, and it doesn't impact the investor at all. You so look, looking at that, and there's all the rhetoric around, it's a 20 year program that the government's got. Um, when does that 20 years start? Um, is it from, like what time does it start? But then oh, also, yeah. once someone gets funding, can that funding be taken away? So what security have the, the participants got? What security have the investors got once they actually commit to the house? So let's talk about the 20 years. So mm -hmm. again, things change over time, but the NDIS said it's the funding is for 20 years. So a lot of people assume, well, when was that from? Is it in Melbourne when it rolled out in 2013? or? Or Queensland in 2019 and Perth only recently in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. When does the 20 years start? Well, I can tell you it used to start from when the certifiers certified the plans. But in the new five-year review, that's changed. It's now every house is on a different 20-year cycle. It starts from the moment we invoice the NDIA when we have a tenant in the house. And there's that's the tick that starts the ticking clock. So literally from the first, first month of rent that the investors being received. That's when your, your house when starts there. Right. So literally every house in Australia is on a different 20 years. It's not like a horse's birthday. No, it's not <laughs> like a horse's birthday. But a lot of people think out there that it is. And look, we have a lot of questions around the 20 years and uh, you know what happens in 20 years. Well, no one really has the answer to that. But we do know, you know, people talk about the the government budgeting, you know, they're going broke here, this, uh, the government's going broke, how can they fund it? Well, look, if, if there was any issue with that, they wouldn't have just increased the funding significantly to get more houses on the ground in March. Mm -hmm. But we all know it's budgeted for $100 billion. That's fixed. And what some people do not realise is that the NDIA, to be brought into fruition, into fruition the, the government of the day and every state premier had to vote unanimously to bring that in. So to take it away, the reverse has to happen. And, uh, and my daughter who's had 18 years in the, in the disability sector and working you know, quite high level in government, 
she has always said to me, oh, Dad, you show me the politician that's going to put their hand up in 20 years' time and say, I want to take away all the funding and therefore everyone would have to leave those houses. Mm. But if that's not political suicide, they've got to then go and get every state premier and the government of the day to vote with them to take that away. Yeah. Now, but is that possible? It may, you know, of course there, everything's there's possible. There's always a possibility. But from an accounting point of view, you've always got to look at the negative. What happens if it did? And now if you look at from from a government's point of view, the cost that they're incurring per participant to be able to put them into a fit-for-purpose house now, what are they actually being charged prior to that participant coming into one of your houses? How much is it costing the government to look after that participant in an inappropriate accommodation right now? Look, I don't know the exact answer to that, but it would be a lot of money, and probably they recognise that they haven't got the money to do a capital construction. Mm. Enter investors to do that capital cost. I mean, let's face it, the government, I don't know how much GST, it used to be like $80,000 GST in one house. I haven't done those calculations or heard about what it is now, but I don't think the government's missing out. And also, you've got to realise that when, when participants come to these houses, especially from really poor environments, and they're in a house that's accessible, it's safe, it's stable, you know, everybody's demeanour changes. Mm. And I've witnessed that with my own eyes. Uh, I've seen people cry coming into these houses. But three or four months later, everybody's demeanour, like everybody's happier there. And uh, people go back to study. People try to do extra with their lives. They don't lean on Medicare as much. And we've heard things like the huge savings in Medicare is in, the, in, in like $100 million saved. Uh, because guess what? We're happier. That's because you change the disposition. We change, we're designs. in a fit for purpose out because everyone needs to realise if you just have to think about your own home, if you were in a car crash and you suddenly became, uh, had quadriplegia, how would you navigate around your house right now, especially if it was two storey? Mm. You know, I, I can tell you that one of our clients, he had that and he couldn't get upstairs. They were showering their father in the downstairs laundry because it had a drain plug. So I can tell you, when he came to one of these purpose-built houses, that was a life-changing moment for Just the, the entire thing. Oh, mm. so many different things. And so, as I said earlier, I have no doubt that if you help us to construct a house, that we can place some participants in. It, it, is, it is going to a great cause. You are helping us enact some social change. And, and let's face it, we, we do need some social change in this arena. Yeah, and like I've, I've always talked about it being a karma investment. From an in income point of view, an investment point of view for the investors like yourself and myself and the people watching this uh, webinar, we're investing into Australia, building Australian homes, but also getting a very good return once the participants are in. I, I, and I we're actually changing people's lives that without the investment, wouldn't actually ch have their lives changed. No, and that's why you have to have a balance in, in understanding. Mm. Like, for us, even when we find a participant, we come to the investor and we tell them as much as the privacy laws will allow us, which won't be their name, of course, but a little bit about their disability and the funding. And we, and our, our agreements are very different. They're a joint venture agreement. So that we wanted the investors to be involved in not just a lease that takes full control. So we come to you, if you if you're with the house, and uh, say, here's someone, this is their, their story, as much as we can tell you, and you choose. Mm. You say, yes, I'm happy to accept those people into my home, and then we go and do the massive amount of paperwork and the moving procedures. But we, we do give you the choice, because you know some people, especially when the funding was low, said no. Now, from our point of view, we would say yes to everybody, you know, because that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that everybody has housing. So but the investor still does have some control about who goes into their homes? Well, with us, you do. Okay. Um, some, you sign a head lease and you lose control. The, the head lease then takes over. Mm. But we just didn't want to be that company, so we, we, don't, we don't do that. Okay. So with, with moving, I suppose, into that area, what are some of the, the SDA management fees that get charged from your side? Oh, okay. So... Uh, I think I've seen everybody's agreements. They are, <laughs> they are wide and varied. But look, most of, uh, probably a, a 
fan fee would be you know ten to twelve, somewhere around that percentage of the gross. Yeah. But I do see wide and varied mm. engagement fees. I, I've seen them up to twenty thousand dollars to so engage. So the engagement with fee is that finding a participant or per participant? Is that what you classify as the engagement fee? So I can speak to our world. So if you want to engage me to help you find participants then we would like to do that when the house is first starting. Mm. So we never ever want to be able to go back to a participant because sometimes we find participants very early. It could be that the house is so well located that once we had them it was just around the corner from an auntie. So, oh, I want that house. So that's, that's seven to nine months before the house is completed. Mm. So, so what we want to do is we never want to be able to go back to that person and say, whoops, sorry, the investor didn't get finance or the land didn't register. So when you can tell me 110% that the home is actually going to build, which is usually around full finance approval, and you can say, hey, the builders call me Brad, and they're going to be on site next week. Mm -hmm. That is the best time to engage any SDA provider, because then that gives us the full seven to nine months of the build, yep. not just to find people, but to match their personalities, because that's something that is missing that I see out there with, you know, People who don't have that history and disability, they don't take the time to tenant what the industry calls tenant matching. Mm. Uh, but we take that. You know, it's not an exact science, but we haven't really failed at that yet because if you take the time to work out, will these two personalities be able to live together? Well, you know what? That means there's no explosion in the house. You don't get thrown in together because it's a share house. People are coming to live together who may have never lived together before. And some, sometimes the physical disability isn't their only disability, is it? No, no, we have a, you know, quite a wide range. We, as I said earlier, we have cognitive impairment, we have uh, some improved livability, we have vision impairment, we mm -hmm. have you know, autism, we have Down syndrome, we have obviously f physical disability where people are in a chair with varying degrees of upper body movement, you know, uh, in high physical support everything from quadriplegia, uh, and unfortunately a lot of people have many different disabilities in that same, in that same category. So mm. it, look, it is very wide and varied, but participants are funded by the government. So they have to go and apply for what's called a housing goal, and then a government assessor will award them and tell people, you know, you can live in an apartment on your own, or a villa on your own, or you can live in a house with three other people, or two other people. You can't live on your own in a house because there's no such thing as one bedroom house funding. Therefore, you always have to share, except for the new Appendix H, which is fortunately has allowed us to be able to put families now into houses, and the NDI has recognised that by increasing the funding. And part of that comes around, like, a lot of the, I suppose some of the rhetoric around the market is, okay, you can have three HPSs in, in a house, but if the house isn't registered for three or two, um, it, it also comes back to what the house is registered for. Is that correct? I get asked that question a lot. So we can enrol a house. So enrolment is at the end of the of the build when we need the um, the certification certificate. So an NDIS certifier comes out at the start, certifies the plans and then they come back at the end to certify that the builders actually built them according to the plans. Mm -hmm. In parallel to that is a normal building certifier, which any house being built, um, you know, a certifier will check on the slab, the plumbing, the wiring, all of that. And so at the end, we get the occupancy certificate from the private certifier, and we get, if it's a HPS house, it's downwards compatible to FA and IL, so we get three certificates there. We wrap that up with a rates notice, if, if it's in your personal name, or if it's a company, we need a, um, you know, an ASIC search, and we also need the trust. We need the front and rear pages of the trust, so the NDIA can see that the person who signed is the person who owns the company, who owns the land, because they want to draw that dot. Mm. So we package that up, throw it down our NDIA portal, and unfortunately, we wait. And if you ask me why we have to wait, I what, do not know. What time is that? <laughs> Look, at times we've seen four to six weeks, but every now and then, one pops out earlier. It is so random, Raymond, we, we don't even know the answer. And if we could communicate with the NDIA by phone, because you can't, you can't get to someone by the phone, it's always through our mm -hmm. portal. 
So unfortunately, we wait and we monitor that. And of course, that's one of the huge tick and checkpoints for us as an SDA provider, because until it's enrolled, we cannot invoice the NDIA for the fund. Can you actually have participants in the house prior to that um, approval coming through? Look, we have done that on a couple of occasions. Ideally, when PC, practical completion, happens, mm. usually when the, when the owner makes the final payment, the builder will issue those certificates. Now, by the time the bank and the valuers come out, that's probably a two to three week process. It would be lovely if we've got participants waiting. The timing would be great to pick up the keys in three weeks and move someone straight in. But if the house isn't funded, we can't get the SDA component. So a lot of people don't realise that the funding comes in two parts. Okay. So if the calculator, and everyone should get the calculator, the, there's a new one out, um, which has got the Appendix H calculation in it, and it will tell you what the funding levels for each category of disability are in an SDA home. So if you, once you've worked that out, you, well, everybody should be able to work out in, in a feasibility kind of way, right? But, but the component comes, if I said to you that a two-bedroom house um, with two-bedroom funded people was $90,000 per person, that 90000 is made up of two components. One is what's called the MRRC, Maximum Reasonable Rent Contribution. That is usually between ten and a half and $11,000. And we collect that from the participant's disability pension. Okay. The balance of that is from the SDA. So when you see the calculator, you will see an SDA funded calculation from the government. And on the bottom of the calculator, it will show you what the MRRC is and it will show you a total of what we call gross funding. So until, until the house is actually certified, all you can get is a rental contribution if the participant's moving prior? So some, on two occasions, we've had a defect in the house. So trades had to come back and that extended that period mm. where we, we got the house enrolled, but the house wasn't handed over. Uh, well, we, we were still doing defects. Mm. So, and what happens is, of course, we've got the reverse of that where the house isn't enrolled and we've got the keys and we've got participants waiting. So on those occasions, we've gone to the owner and said, look, can we move these people in? They're coming out of a, a, you know, an aged care or a hospital. Can we move them in? Now be aware, you, we can only get the RRC component mm. until your house is kicked by the NDIA. Now, we've never failed to have that done. Uh, so it's a safe maneuver to do that. And we have, we have done that a couple of times with the owner's permission. Because why would you want to leave someone just out in the cold when they could be in a house? So look, I'm pleased to say all our owners have got some heart in these projects, yeah. and that's never been an issue. But we've only had to do that a couple of times. Excellent. So, um, participant matching fees, annual inspection. Is it annual inspections? What are the fees? What are the charges? What happens around that side of it from the... Good question. So, there's always rates in building insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, for everybody who's watching, the building insurance is not normal house insurance. There's a business going on within that home, so it's a commercial level of insurance. If you're not north of the Tropic of Capricorn in Queensland, in Cyclone Zone, it's about three and a half thousand. It certainly jumps a couple of thousand if you're up there. Mm. Um, but you need that insurance. You can't try and trick anybody by, if you ever have to make a claim, it will not be valid if you don't have that correct insurance. And look, there's a couple of people out there that have got specialized policies. There aren't many insurers that do it, but some of them do it really well. Mm. Uh, we can help people with that. But the other costs are things like normal investment house costs, smoke alarm inspections, um, termite inspections. We actually specialised SDA. We need a fire blanket and fire extinguisher inspection, but that's every six months. If you allowed around three or four hundred dollars, it's different in every state. Yeah. But if you allowed say three or four hundred dollars for each of those elements it probably comes to about $7,000 roughly because we also have to do an audit on the hot water system because not many people realise that in the hygiene areas you need a 55 degree water temperature. You know, in case you get scalded and you can't turn the tap off. Mm -hmm. In the washing machine and kitchen it's okay, but most, or well, I think nearly every hot water system, 65 degrees is the lowest you can do. So we have to deploy some mechanical 
um, devices in the walls to make sure that the temperature is dropped in those hygiene areas. Mm -hmm. But we have to do a yearly audit on that. So there's a small cost to that as well. But that is your entire cost. If you were running a feasibility, you would take those costs, roughly seven, take off the provider fees and your loan costs, and there's your true net amount. How does it go, there's some talk about fire sprinklers in each of the different states being oh. coming into play? <laughs> My goodness, there's so much noise around that and and we're all still working it out. But I've said to many people, like in, in Perth, there's been a house that's been knocked back there recently. Even though it was approved 18 months ago, mm -hmm. things have been very slow through COVID. But it's come to the end. One NDI certifier who I spoke to said, oh, it should never be certified, but it was certified. And which we believe it was okay to be certified without fire sprinklers, but the local council's private certifier has gone, no, the Australian Building Code has changed and it's very specific, a HBS house needs fire sprinklers. Mm. So I can speak to 10 different people and get 10 different responses on the fire sprinklers. But here's my response. <laughs> <laughs> There's four reasons for putting them in. One, it's morally sound to do so. That's for all the people watching. It's definitely morally sound to do that. Alternatively, it also makes the house more desirable. I always said to many people, again, if you had a person who was your daughter or son, and there were two houses, one's got fire sprinklers, one's not, which one would you choose, Raymond, for your fire son or daughter? 100%. Correct. So there's that element. Secondly, you future-proof the house against the possibility of the government mandating all SDA homes to do that and you don't want to be punching holes in your ceiling and running pipes later it's got to be more expensive if you retrofit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and fourthly if none of those arguments appeal to you you get paid now three to five thousand dollars if you've got fire sprinklers in your home extra so i know in perth i think it's around five so in a two-bedroom house that's ten thousand dollars that's per participant per participant so say it's 5,000 each, 10. In Perth, the fire sprinklers were somewhere, um, you know, 40 to 50,000, mm -hmm. again, varies. But look, that's paid off in five years. Mm -hmm. And for the next 15 years, you're earning, what, 150,000 extra on your investment. So if it, it doesn't appeal to you emotionally to do the right thing, there's, a, there's certainly a, a commercial aspect to doing it. And there'll be more than likely some sort of inspection is it quarterly, so, annually? Yes. So every council's got a different rule on that, but mm. every six months, certainly for any of the fire stuff, repeatedly, mm. but depending on the system, you could have monthly, quarterly, or six monthly inspections. Yeah. And some of those also are, um, are mandating back to base. Yeah, in so in, in Sydney, my latest um, information is that now any SDA home in Sydney must be full class three. Mm. So in other states, except for Queensland, Queensland has got a little a piece of legislation where they don't have to adhere to this fire sprinkler code. So in Queensland, no. But in Adelaide, Perth, Sydney, literally mandatory for a HBS house now. And that's full back to base. Mm. Mm. You hear costs of you know, 70,000, the fire panel being 25. I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure out there if we, <laughs> if we looked around, it might be cheaper, but that's kind of the going rate. Yeah. But full class three is insulation in the walls, um, a different energy rating. It's like building an apartment building. It's the same rules and regulations. There are more costs now in Sydney to build, mm. but Sydney is still an area that has enormous undersupply of housing, and we're we're really chasing to have as many investors as possible build us a home in Sydney because there's such a great need there. And I did a webinar on that just recently, um, specifically on Sydney and and uh, we really detail the numbers. Mm. And there's a massive need here. Yeah, excellent. Leases, 20 years. Um, what happens at the end of that 20 years? So Does it become not an SDA house? So we don't really know because of what I said earlier. We assume it will just continue on. Mm. Now, will the, the new houses now be classified as an old build, not a new build? They might have a funding drop, a funding level. Mm. Just like houses that were um, enrolled prior to the 1st of July, they didn't get the full benefit of the increased funding. They were at five or $6,000 left. 
uh, some people said in apartments, they said, oh, they've, they've cut the funding. And I heard this recently. You, you, Brad, you said that the legislation said the funding couldn't be changed. Uh, they didn't change the funding level for apartments. What they did is introduce a new concept, which was GST <laughs> claiming. <laughs> so in our houses, if you look at the calculator, there's a new drop down which says GST claimed credits or not. Mm -hmm. Now, in an apartment building, most developers would claim the GST on the way through. Mm -hmm. But in a house, we, uh, I've heard of you know, people trying to get their accountants to get the GST claim. Well, you would know that. You're an accountant. And we haven't been seen anybody successful in claiming GST for a house, even if they're registered with you. Um, we've seen it as a going concern that there's got to be participants in the premises by the time the investor takes it over. Oh, well, that's not possible in our world unless it's a resale. That's right. Yeah. So with the GST claiming, it changes the yearly payment. Mm. So in apartments, if you claim the GST, it's not 100,000 roughly anymore, it's about 93. So, but you know, there is, we have seen um, now, because an owner can accept someone, say, from a house. So if you had an apartment and you didn't necessarily want $100,000 income, I could come to you and say, look, I've got an improved livability person that's in a house, but they want to live on their own in your apartment. Um, would you accept them into your house? And there are ways we can work with the NDIA to have them come if you, as the owner, were willing to accept the, the funding that may be and may be less. Okay. So there's there are some complexities that we, we can have long chats about. Uh, that's not one. Uh, Again, that comes back to working with SDA professionals that are in the space every day. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So lease lease terms, and now looking at it from a participant's point of view, what's the importance of the lease term from the participant's point of view? Look, this is. I've always said that it's like two worlds colliding. If you come at this investment from a property brain, just like we did with our normal in investments, you actually don't get it right. It's like, let's start with the money. No, no, let's start with getting it right for the participant. Mm -hmm. The money will follow. And with the leases, we have found that we decided to do you know, a 20 year lease with the owner, and then we sublet to the participants or, or guardians or or you know, stakeholders that so can from, from your side, if I'm the investor, I'm, I'm leasing my investment property to you, the SDA provider, for, 20, for the next 20 years? Yes, so we need to have control of the house to do our mandated job from the NDIS. Mm. We are literally the eyes and ears of the NDIS. I said to someone the other day, we're like the private certifier. Can I, can I go out to a normal real estate agent to do that? No. Okay. However, I have seen some agreements from um, SDA providers that I see them advertising 5% fees and 7% fees and, and then when you open up the agreement the first thing you see is plus 4% garden and maintenance, 5% audit fees, and, you know, on it goes and suddenly you're at 17% mm -hmm. and then if you don't want to do the property management you have to go and then get an agent you know, at another 5% to go and do that. So you've got to be very careful about what you see in the agreements. Mm. But the head lease is really important to us, but also the head lease can stop a bank walking through the lease because our responsibility is to the participant. Our agreements are with the participant and their well-being. So, so what, why is a 20-year lease with me important to the participant? Oh, right. So here's what we get asked a lot. How long is your lease with the owner? And that's from the participant. Because most of the people who come at this from a real estate brain or investment property perspective, and actually for an investor, <laughs> that should be their first warning sign they're with the wrong people if they're saying to do a five by five by five or a five by 10. Mm. And I've even seen two year head leases. But of course, after two years, guess what the SDA provider's doing? Increasing their fees. That's why they do that. Right. And they need to be participant based. But of course, if I say to you 20 years, oh, most of the investors would say, no, 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 Brad, I, I, you know, I'm not locking in. What if I don't like you in five years' time? You know? So what we did was we left some exit clauses in the background so that we can honestly say we want to protect the participant's interest in the house. So this way, we can ensure that the participant can live in that house for as long as they want. But we also acknowledge we're not that company that wants to lock someone in if we're not performing. 
Mm. So we left some exit clauses in the background for our non-performance. And um, by the way, we've never been terminated. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that really gives the, I suppose, the certainty for the participants coming in that they have actually got somewhere to stay long term. Well, you tell me, why would you put any barrier in front of us as the SDA provider? Mm. Any barrier at all to a participant not choosing your house? Mm. And that, that longevity of stay. So look, we, we, we don't see people jumping around. And that's another question I get asked a lot. You know, do they come, do they go? When people choose these houses, they choose them as if they're going to live there forever. Mm. We do not see, and I thought we would, but we just don't see this jumping. I thought maybe you're in Queensland, your parents moved to Sydney and you followed them, but people are making very careful choices. The stakeholders around are choosing location and housing to suit the needs of the residents. And we are seeing, you know, a, a, a lot of houses not jump around. I mean, we have, I think it, we have had 11 people leave our houses, but every one of those was at God's calling, you know, mm. no one left willing, you know, and, you know, that's a tragic moment in time for that, but we don't see people, oh, jumping over here on high mood suburbs, we, we actually haven't seen that range. Mm. So in, in that situation where someone does the part, whose responsibility is it to, to find that new participant and what sort of costs are associated in doing that and what sort of income, I suppose, from the investor's point of view covers that period? Look, in, if we're talking about fees, like our, ours, uh, just a straight percentage, you know, twelve point five percent, and we've got no sneaky fees. There's no, you know, lawn and garden maintenance. We we push that garden maintenance to the participant and the stakeholders there, the civil providers, mm. and we monitor, you know, that the lawn's being mowed. But I can tell you, these houses are pristine. You, there are carers in that house twenty four hours a day mopping, you know, they, they have hygiene or audits to consider in that house, they can't let a germ in. Uh, I turn up, you know, thermometer, sign the book, and you know, if I touch something I feel like they're spraying and wiping behind <laughs> me. These houses are beautifully presented, you know, there are no clothes on the floor, you know, to open the cupboard door, everything's lined up like a Woolworths shelf. It, they are well looked after mm. because they are caring for people who are vulnerable. So the normal it leads me into that question because a lot of people have this idea that you know they've had a normal investment property and they worry about someone you know smashing the house, running away, or but it, we just don't see that. This, yeah. it, this just does not happen in our NDI at all. No one's, no one's you know smashing up the house and leaving. There, it's too you know. Everyone's and there, there, there are some horror stories out in the market about normal able-bodied participants and what they oh, do to houses. It's just yeah. doesn't apply. It's a different different space. Well, Carers are in there with line of sight. They they shouldn't be outside gardening. They are in with their participants, caring for them, pretty much line of sight. Mm -hmm. So they would have to do something wrong if there was a behaviour that you know um, you know they were watching it to at least take some action. They'd be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So with with the maintenance, if the, if the carers, if the participants do a little bit of maintenance, who's responsible for the maintenance? As you said, the gardening. Um, general maintenance of the house, who's responsible for that on a week to week, month to month so basis? Participants have funding that they can utilise for that. Mm. So normally that's what happens. And we, we, as I said, we still check on that as part of our, if we wear that real estate hat, but we don't really charge for that. We just wanted to have good eyes on the house, open it up for electricians or plumbers or, you know, people that need to get into the house because you just can't walk into one of our houses where people have disability, you, you know, you need a blue card, yellow card to do that, or we need to be there to open that house up. Mm. And that gives us the opportunity to keep an eye on things. And that's why we did it, you know, because sometimes, you know, just a body language, a glance might say there's something wrong here. Whereas an, a real estate agent, with no disrespect to them, you know, may not pick that up if they haven't had the same training that we've mm. had. So they're the reasons we do it. And our fees are fixed, we don't CPI them, um, by the way, though, the government does, and I often get asked that question a lot, the government does CPI the income, they're, they're, they're funding across. Okay, is that every year that they come, gets adjusted or what? Yeah, CPI. Okay. Yeah, so there's always that increase, and look, I can't speak to every SDA provider, I know some of them do CPI their fees, and but you just got to watch out for those sneaky fees, where we're just a straight, flat payment, and we do everything for that. Yeah, so if you've got a flat fee at 12.5%, 
and the CPI goes up, you effectively get your CPI increase based on that fee anyway. Correct. So uh, I've <laughs> said that to many investors in a commercial sense. If the government increases the payment, well, you and I both benefit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So on, on the, in, the rental income, how do, how do the investors actually receive that income and when do they receive it? Okay, so we can only invoice monthly arrears. Okay. So uh, I've said to all investors, be sure that when the house completes, even if we have a participant ready to move in, we cannot invoice until the first month is over. So you need to have that first month's payments up your sleeve. And I know a lot of brokers now are, are building that into the loan mm -hmm. uh, because there's no way uh, SDA funding will pay that first month. It's just not possible. So, um, <laughs> so in, in terms of the that situation, the second month we would move people in. We invoice on the first of the month, and we actually get the money back from the NDI quite quickly. And in our world, we, we pay everybody on the seventh. Okay. So everyone can wake up on the eighth and, and see the funding, provided the NDIA don't mess it up in some sort of paperwork, which we've seen a few times. And um, understand? <laughs> yeah. So there's a whole story right there. So fun. Go back a little bit. Um, participants and funding. Just because someone's disabled, that doesn't automatically necessitate that they've got NDIS funding attached to it. There are two separate arenas. One is the care package. So many participants are still living at home uh, mm. with their families and they're receiving care from people who come to the house and do that. Mm. Completely separate. We, we are not involved in that. Um, the owner, you're not involved in that. You are only involved with us in the SDA component, which is simply the funding for a participant to live in their own home. So as part of that, a participant chooses their carer and they will bring them to the house. Now, we will obviously, you know, audit the carer to make sure we're, we're happy with that as well. Mm. And in we all go to the house and then we monitor what's going on in the house in every sense of the word, from a provider perspective. And as I said, we choose to do it from a real estate perspective. So you would get a monthly statement just like you would from any uh, real estate agent. And we would look after that. Now, in terms of those costs we spoke about earlier, it would always be smart to put a little bit away for a rainy day because just like in a normal home, if the hot water system breaks down out of warranty, then we would be calling you to say, hey, bad news, we've got to replace the hot water. Um, same with the aircon units out of, out of warranty, you, you would do that. So, but whilst things are under warranty, and for the first, every state's got different rules. In Queensland, it's a year, and I think in Perth, it's four months. Mm. Um, the builder must come back to fix anything, even if it's a leaking tap. So we just need to be conscious that after that warranty period, for anything, there's still the builder's warranty for structural concrete, the slabs, the roof, water inundation, all of that goes on on varying, you know, 12 to 20 years. So mm -hmm. there's still those guarantees in play. But we manage, you know, after those warranties, uh, you know, we'll manage and organise, just like a normal agent, we'll organise someone to come to the house to fix the tap, change the light bulb, you know. So I don't have to worry about the toilets blocking and getting a call. No, well, we've had that. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, it's usually with the brand new houses. And uh, twice that's happened to us a couple of days in because they've left some concrete in the pipe, you know, when they poured the slab and they've had to put one of the machines down and drill it out. Yeah. Yeah. So we have had that. All right. A big point, demand and data, I know we touched on it briefly, that's changed over the period of time and what's available on the government websites, how do you handle that, what have people so seen, how do they make their decisions about where to build? So if you're making your own decisions about that, it's probably not ideal. You really do need to consult someone who's mapping the data out. Mm -hmm. And there's, like I did a, um, you know, we do that internally because we want to know. We, we never want to say, Raymond, build a house here and put seven to nine months of our energy to find participants which we know aren't there. Mm -hmm. So we want to be absolutely involved in location and design. In fact, the very first thing I would ask you to do would be to upload your plans and upload your location. Um, and then we would write back and say, look, we think that's a great location and we're happy to be the SDA provider for that house. Mm. Now, normally we deal with a lot of uh, companies that are you know, helping investors find these places. We deal with some of those, but let me tell you, we, we have 
certainly given the same rules to everybody. You know, it, don't just send someone to us that you've chosen the location. Make sure you check with us that if you want us to be the SDA provider, mm -hmm. then you know we come with a couple of conditions, which is you know let us have some input to where you're finding the land. So we do talk to a lot of different companies across Australia and say, look, this area is good, but still send me the block. I got caught once because the block was, the area was good, but this was backed up onto a four lane freeway. And of course, <laughs> the noise, you know, we had to go, no, no, no. So that's why we ask people to upload the exact block location so we can have a look at it. Yeah, pe people, I, I know I've had discussions with clients and it's like, I, I own this block of land, I want to put an SDA house on it. And they think just because they've got the block of land, it's going to make it a good position for an SDA. Oh, no. Uh, the, many of the lots do not suit SDA. And, mm. and the main reason is there's a compliance issue that a, a participant must be able to get access to their letterbox. And there's only a, a small gradient of slope. I think it's 1 in 14, don't, don't quote me. But if, you, if it's more than that, the block is not suitable. Mm. So sometimes you can cut and fill the block. Sometimes you can put a... Uh, you know, a zigzag ramp down to the letterbox, but that's something if you're choosing your own block, you certainly need to make sure the contours are right and mm. that it can fit compliance. That's the big one. Mm. So, with the SDA, where's the best place? $121 question Where's the best place to build a house? How many participants are around Australia? Like, what, what's the data telling you at the moment? Okay, so I'll get. Here's my example. So we're in Sydney today, right? If you said to me, Brad, I've got a block of land on Sydney Harbour and I want, I want to build an SDA house. I would probably say to you, Raymond, that is a great choice. In fact, I might even say to you, I know that participants will love that house. In fact, I'll probably have a queue up of people wanting to jump into <laughs> it, right? But it's an unviable investment. The land could be 20 or 30 million if, exactly. if it was even available. Yeah. You know, but. You know, you might say, I want to build out near the Blue Mountains where there's no hospitals, no infrastructure. Well, it's, it's a bit like Goldilocks. Well, that's a bit too hot in by the harbour. That's too cold. Mm. We want to be in the Goldilocks zone, which is kind of halfway between those greenfield areas where the price of the land is probably more expensive, but it's closer into the city infrastructure. Mm. And somewhere in that Goldilocks zone, if you like, where it's just right, that's where I think the future of SDA lies. It's not out in the greenfield estates. But if you are out there, you certainly need to be building the right style of house. Two living areas are maybe a little bit bigger and better because you will have competition in those areas. Mm. Um, mm. So it's very important to check. So even without looking at the data, that Goldilocks zone, if you like, is you probably don't need the data to be there. You just need to make sure the block's okay. Mm. But of course, the other flip side of that is if you want to utilise your SDA funding, you've got to come to where the houses are being built. And we are seeing, like, in a city, like, a lot of people would like to live on their own in houses, but you can't, you, there's no funding for that. A lot of people would like to live really close to the city, but there's no land there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the new land is a little bit further out, but we still need to be mindful to be close to hospitals, parks, big shopping centres, transport corridors. You still need those. Uh, that infrastructure because participants will choose that. You know, mm. There's still lifestyle issues that are going on there. How, how does that go um, in inner city into the areas where there's not new houses? What's the demand and what's the, I suppose, how do you take an old house and make it into an NDIS house compared to building a new house that's well, purpose built? You've seen Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. <laughs> Uh, converting the old houses is literally that. We, we have attempted working with people to take an old house, but there are some rules that the NDIA has applied, and mm. I, I think it's over 600000 now that you've got to spend on the renovation to start with, mm. which is literally a knockdown and, and build something that's absolutely fit for purpose. Yeah. But a lot of people ask me about that, but if you take most old houses, you know, there's a, a a corridor, a hallway, bedrooms either side, in the back, the living areas. Well, straight away, we've got to widen the hallway to mm. get compliance. And, you know, that house is probably up a bit. Um, as soon as you widen the hallway, you've just messed with all the structural components in the ceiling and the roof, and you've compressed all the bedrooms to the right-hand side, which, and of course, we need to enlarge them. Mm. So what do you do then? Blow out the side of the house. 
And then there's the other thousand things, the wiring, the power points have got to be 550 off the ground, the beams in the ceiling. It, we have never been able to make that fly because it's probably cheaper to knock it down and do it. And I think knocking an old house down that's closer in, someone who's owned a house for a very long time, this is a great way to go. <laughs> so, especially in Sydney, where I looked at a house yesterday while I was here, and the gentleman's owned that for uh, over 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, it's an old brick home. It's on 900 square metres. He says the value is $2 million. So we're going to try and um, I'm encouraging him to build an NDIS home on that site because it's at Paramount, very close to the hospital, to the giant Westmead Hospital. It's an ideal site for NDIS and mm. and you don't really need data in Sydney to make that fly because the recent data for Sydney was, um, if you look at the webinar, we had, there was something like 2,900 places needed in Sydney. And what sort of housing are coming online in Sydney? There's 711, you know, the data's fresh in my mouth, that are existing, but there's something like 1,200 that need um, converting, you know, mm. there, there's 53, Legacy homes. Now, the, the legacy homes are those old SDA homes that have roof homes. Six to ten bedrooms, yeah, that the government's been building. There's 53 of those still. Wow. So there's six to ten times 53 that need new housing just in that little space. But Sydney, of course, what, 1.9 million, they tell me, 5 million over the area. Mm. On a percentage basis, there's a lot of people in Sydney that will have disability. But because it's 1.5 million or more to build one of these houses because the land, your land is crazy, Raymond, $800,000 <laughs> I saw yesterday. Um, that just makes the, you know, it's probably the reason there aren't a lot of houses satisfying the demand in Sydney. So uh, for us, I'm happy to make an appeal to everybody. If you can help us provide a house in Sydney, there's gonna be a lot of grateful people for that. Mm. But also the, the type of housing you're building in Sydney Again, fit for purpose, but purpose built for Sydney for the returns that are coming into Sydney to be able to justify the costs. Look, I, I have spoken uh, to a, a gentleman only last week. Um, I'm meeting him tomorrow. He has always bought investment property in Sydney. Mm. And he, he gave me a lecture. He even said, Brad, uh, I will not buy in other states. You will never convince me to buy in Queensland or Adelaide or Perth or... He said, I've invested in Sydney. I said, but Sydney prices are going like this. And I'm sure, he, through the phone, he, he was like, he said, you know how many people have been telling me this for the last 20 years, that Sydney's not gonna keep going? He said, but it always does. Yeah. His view is a million today, two million tomorrow. And he's been proven right. It's a hard argument to not so, but he's been spending 1.3 million on a normal investment property. Mm. And his, uh, his question to me was, after we'd had this sort of a chat with him, he said, so if I give you an extra $200,000 to build me one of the NDSs, you're saying that you could potentially get me over $200,000 in income? And I said, potentially, yes. But, you know, depending on the different matches of disability, it could be less. It might only be, you know, down around $100,000, for instance. Um, he said, Brad, I'm getting $47,000 now on a $1.3 million house. Yeah. He said, if you can prove that to me, I'll build three for you. I said, all right, I'll prove that. So he's starting with one. So it's that kind of um, situational awareness where Sydney's very different from the other, mm -hmm. other states. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's cost-driven. The reason we don't have the houses is because they're 1.6. But I'm finding that many people have grown up in the Sydney market, have had houses for a very long time, and so just the, the, the property has risen they can they have a lot of equity in the land to be able to change that equation and get some extra income and help us at the same time. Mm. It, is, it is an in interesting environment, Sydney. It, it is very different. Um, I've been here a couple of days now looking at just to try and understand the differences. Uh, it's complex. So with with the housing, what I know we touched on this, what type of housing design have the lowest level of vacancy? Good question. So if I look at our portfolio, we have a lot of those early houses, and I'll call them the single living area ones, uh, because they were the only houses available to us when we first started. So we have many of those houses that have got three people in them, mm. but not three high physical support people. 
because of the for the reasons I spoke about earlier. But we do have, you know, a mixture of disabilities across that those houses. Now, pre first of July, you know, those houses had a much lower funding level than they do now. Uh, all the owners are very happy with the new <laughs> with the new funding levels. Mm. So even they have worked out to be really great investments. But what we're seeing now, this two living area concept, is definitely one of the key elements. You know, and making sure that the functionality of the appliances and the, the layout is also suitable. You know, making sure the bathrooms aren't just the bare minimum turning circle. You know, to give people bigger space, uh, quality of life. Mm. I mean, if we went into a house, we'd be the same. We're going to choose the small ones. We're going to choose the big one. One that's more functional. Yeah. Yeah. So. The design elements are, uh, are very important mm. and bigger is better, obviously. A backyard is great because you know a lot of people have assistive animals, the backyard's good for that, but also just to be able to get out and you know be in the open air mm. is, is, a, is a very big thing. So in design... So a lot, of, a lot of that's a bit of psychology behind that in being able to, okay, you're not stuck in between four walls every day, 24-7 you've actually got somewhere to go to. Well, lately I've just been trying to say to everybody, you know, look at it through the participants' eyes. To understand this investment, let go of the money, get confidence in what you are doing by understanding the needs of the, of the resident. Mm. If you get that, you will end up building a house that will be more desirable. It will be chosen before all the others. Mm. It's mm. not rocket science. And if you do that, you're doing something meaningful. You're providing a safe and stable environment for someone who really needs it. And, you know, we will manage that for you for the next 20 years. And everybody wins. Participant gets a great house. Because you did the right thing in the location and design, you've got a great income. We get a small percentage of what you do in a, in a commercial sense. Everybody wins. And, and changing and, lives. And we are changing lives for the better. And that's our ethos. And we're sticking to it. Mm -hmm. So, starting to wrap up a little bit. Australia, where where is the demand? Like we're talking about Sydney, there's huge demand, but whereabouts in Sydney is there a demand? Is there an oversupply in different areas? Not in Sydney. Sydney, you have to pull Sydney out. It's it's unique on its own. Yeah. If you were near transport corridors in Sydney, we have got um, houses coming out, even in Leppington, Austral, Blacktown, Campbelltown. Some of the investors are, are knocking down some old houses closer in, like in Parramatta, Granville, uh, one in like Surrey Hills. Mm. Uh, I told you what the land value there is worth. But again, the income for that person is, is quite low uh, compared to even a newer home. Mm. But those people have owned these houses for a very long time, which means they paid less, they now have great equity, and they can help us. Mm. You mm. Know, and it helps them because they'll get a better return. In other states, You've got to be just, as a general guideline, you know, be in closer, be in the Goldilocks zone. But some of the other areas certainly have demand, and regional centres mm -hmm. have demand. You know, I've been speaking with silk providers on the ground, and that's been an interesting conversation. So a lot of the silk providers, you know, they have people that are on, you know, in their world that they need to um, help them come out of a SIL environment into an SDA environment and, and get their SDA funding. There are support coordinators and planners helping to do that. So, but when they, when they do that, we're trying to communicate with them and find out where they need those houses, where do those participants want to live. So we're having conversations with a lot of different SIL providers to try and identify where they need their housing. Mm -hmm. Because oh, it's a disgrace that it takes so long for the government to approve someone to get their SDA funding. Uh, it, it really is making them jump through some hoops. And That has come down a little bit though over the last couple of years. It was probably, if we were speaking last year, we'd say it'd be 9 to 12. I, I'm hearing that it's possibly, you know, five or six months now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's still a, 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 long, a long time mm -hmm. for a government to process, given that a lot of the people are institutions. I mean, the, the data from the NDIS, it, you know, it doesn't account for anybody who's in the pipeline getting their funding coming through. Mm. It, it doesn't mm. see them. It only sees the people who kind of drop out of the pipeline into the light. NDIS data sees them. It doesn't account for anybody who's in a hospital bed, you know, a million dollars a year for a bed. It doesn't account for all the people in aged care where we've got 18-year-olds mixing with 80-year-olds. 
lots of mental health issues there. So you know, we're doing our best to communicate with those institutions to find a, a, a you know, safe housing. And of course, it doesn't account for all the legacy homes too much. Though the recent data has shown, like in Sydney now, we're seeing how many legacy homes are actually out there, but it didn't do that in the in the early data. Mm. So you've got to sort of mix that in, and I'm trying to develop an algorithm now that shows and predicts oversupply. And we've done that already on a couple of occasions, like Logan in Brisbane. Mm. You know, a couple of hundred vacancies there, because in 2019 the land was cheap. Everyone built minimum standard compliance houses by the hundreds. Mm. So a lot of the people, look, a lot of the people who were promoting the properties, everybody was new to it. A lot of them didn't understand that you need to look at it through the participants' eyes. And nobody tracked how many houses were going into a certain area. So naturally, an investor went for a cheaper price on a, on a cheaper house that was still compliant. Mm. But it's, it's not the essence of this. And it's really a change of a mindset from the investor's point of view, um, not necessarily, as you're saying, go cheaper to get the best return. The return's there, like with the income that the government's attached to each of the participants to be able to provide the quality accommodation. Being able to provide the quality accommodation, as you said, if you need to put, and you should be putting a little bit of extra, give fit for purpose, give more than fit for purpose, to be able to, from an investment point of view, I'm going to use the word loosely guarantee the best outcome for yourself. <laughs> and I know there's no guarantee, but to do the best you can in your investment. As I, when I built investment homes, we've treated it like we're going to live there and then we've looked at it through our eyes for the tenants. So when we're putting things in, we put in stone bench tops and we put in additional things to make sure from a tenant's point of view, we always get the best tenant and therefore maximum rent. There's no really difference in the SDA space. No, you want to do the best you can mm. for the residents who are going to live in your house. Mm. And look, it's, it's really not difficult, but you definitely need to be guided by the data. We, you know, we can help people with that. And mm. Because everybody needs to win in that triangle. But I'm worried for you know some areas that I've seen, you know, King Roy, you know, where I've seen people building out there because they're advised to areas where there just isn't the, the, the number of people wanting to live there. Mm. And you know, and there's been some danger in some of the greenfield estates in, in some of the towns that are just too far out. Mm. You know, so we've just got to be careful and, and just take advice. And the best advice is from the participants themselves and where yeah. well, that's what we try to do. You know, try to get act on their advice to get the best outcome for everybody. Yeah, no. That's that's great. And I suppose not only the advice on the SDA provider side um, in where to build the property and to who, what to build, but we also need to, I suppose, touch base briefly on how you're going to hold that property. Because investors, undoubtedly, they're going to be buying property. Are they getting the right advice from financial planners, accountants? Um, and can those advisors actually advise on these type of properties? Look, with due respect to everybody, this space has been so complex and everyone's got there's so much noise and a lot of it's unfortunately mythical. Um, and what we try to do by doing these sort of interviews is try and put a straight line through that noise to what we're actually seeing on the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've said to every investor that, you know, the person who sells you the land, they don't care what you do with it after that, they're gone. But potentially we have a 20 year relationship with with the person who built the house. So we've got to be straight, integrous, honest, mm. very accurate in our data assessments, as much as we can be, um, because our relationship potentially is for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got to get it right early days, and therefore we have a great responsibility. We don't want to advise anybody to build in an area where, where our job might be difficult what, to what, find participants that don't want to live in that area. We're not, we're not. We don't want to take that on. It's mm -hmm. unviable commercially, and it's just not right to build a house, have a have a, um, an investor build a house in an area where someone knows it will be very difficult to tenant. Mm -hmm. But we just don't want to be in that arena. It's, it's, it's just not right. It's wrong. Yeah. So I suppose wrapping up, 
you should, as an investor, you should always be getting professional advice. If you're going to be playing in the NDIS space, you need professional advice like Brad's firm provides in that space. You need to be getting your right financial advice, whether it's your financial plan or your accountant. But you've then also got to understand and ask them the questions, do they actually understand the NDIS SDA space? Do they understand property? Right. If they if they say no to any of those, you probably need to get your advisors to talk to Brad um, and his team to be able to start getting an understanding of that. How to structure it? What you can do in structure? Whether it's a, a family, whether it's personal, whether you own this personally, right? Is that the best position? Are you going to own it in a company, a family trust, a unit trust, right? Or a lot of a lot of people are doing now. Are they going to be owning it into their superannuation fund to be able to support them in long term retirement? Understanding all that and getting the right advice to be able to, I suppose, structure your affairs and your investment affairs to be able to be providing these sort of properties to the industry that needs it. They need investments like investors like you investing your money um, ethically and on a karma basis to be able to change people's lives so we can actually change your lives as well. So. You actually, when you were saying that, talking from a purely investment point of view, one of the questions that I do get asked a lot is, that Brad, you know, what if we want to sell the house? Mm. And we, we will never stop you selling the house. If you wanted to sell it vacant, we'd be having a discussion about that because our mandate is participant can live as long as they want. Mm. But there have been situations with mutual agreement, everybody's, everybody's moved. But all you do is, is if you had a commercial shed with a, you know, a panel beater in it, and it was a ten-year lease, the incoming purchase would certainly want that lease attached to their incoming sale. And it's no different for us. We're happy to put as long as you put our agreement next to the contract of sale. Mm -hmm. um, we've sold a few houses that way, and I can tell you that the incoming purchase would not have made the purchase without our agreement attached. That's right, because, because they are high cash flow properties. Because that is where the income is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everyone, you know, again. We're very participant first. Let's get it right for them. That is the secret to it. Mm. Right location, right design, right SDA. That's the end of breaking. No, Brad. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, you spending time with us today. No, it's a pleasure, Ryan. Guys, if you've got any questions, reach out. Click the link below. Uh, we'd love to be able to get back in touch with you and start you on your either start you or continue on your investment journey into the NDIS SDA um, space. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Brad. Thank you, everybody.